The Reef Therapy Podcast is powered by ICP Analysis. If you'd like to win a free saltwater ICP analysis kit and a freshwater analysis kit, all you have to do is leave a comment down below using the hashtag what's in your water. If you're listening to the audio only version, head on over to YouTube and you can enter in the comment section there. ICP Analysis will test over 50 elements down to parts per trillion. These tests can also be used to see if there's any undesirable elements in your aquarium as well. Register your aquarium on the ICP Analysis app, fill your sample, place it back into the bag, slap on that included postage, and have your results one to three days after it's received. More at icpanalysis.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Ladies Take Over. Today, we have Chelsea and Sarah with me. Um, Jen, unfortunately, was unable to make it this evening because there is apparently a very bad snowstorm and ice storm that is happening in Minnesota. So hopefully, Jen is able to stay safe and uh, she's able to get home safely as well and there are no more additional weather problems that could you know disrupt her life i hate i bad weather is just like sarah you probably get it pretty well also being in colorado like negative weather aspects just aren't super fun makes your day just like a little bit trickier it's like ninja warrior but with like weather oh i never thought about like that I still don't know about like Jen's got all that livestock to worry about too, but I'm sure she's got her her protocol in place. Right. Well, even whenever, you know, anybody in the area has got tanks, like you have to be worried about your livestock there too. So, but today we're going to hang out and chat about cleanup crew. So what, uh, what's everybody's favorites? Who do you think, you know, maybe does the best work or, you know, someone that you label as cleanup crew so you can put them in your tank because maybe you want to look at them like uh, <clears throat> the chestnut sale. I like those. <laughs> so does Sean. But uh, I don't really think I've ever been able to say they wiped out something for me that was bothering me in my tank or, you know, growing like crazy. But maybe it's just because I could only put in a small amount from time to time. So, but chestnut snail is my favorite one for appearance. The orange ones? Yeah. And they glow uh, under your night lights or your lunar lights, uh, which is pretty cool. I didn't realize they fluoresced. Mm-hmm. That's really cool. Yep. Man, I'm going to mess with that tonight. Because I have a few. Well, I got to put that on my list of glowy critters. Yeah, it's a glowy critter. They're not like super bright, but you can tell they've got it. And um, it just makes it, I think that they have a beautiful shell shape too. And they're easy to spot. And usually whenever you do get to purchase them, they're good size. Um, Which I know that sometimes whenever you're getting cleanup crew, it can be tough because it's either everybody's too big that you're trying to put in and they're like, I know a Mexican turbo and they're bulldozing everything or they're little and then they just kind of get stuck in all the crevices and then they're stuck and they never can get out. So <laughs> there's just those little, little things that happen. So that's but like a nice part of haven't you? So. You guys have kept chestnut snails before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have some. Yeah. I love those guys. Okay. So who do you guys like aesthetically? That's part of cleanup crew that maybe doesn't always do a perfect job. I like zebra hermits. Oh yeah. I just, I just think they're, they're active. So I I see them a lot for how small they are. Like they're cruising. They're constantly running around. They got that one big claw. That's really impressive and just very striking. And I think they do a decent job as detritivores, but overall I, I like them because I just like how they look. Yeah. Those I think the ho- they're not total monsters. <laughs> That's kind of like the Halloween hermits, like, yeah, like the that. blue, the electric blues and the Halloweens. Like they look mm-hmm. really pretty, but they kind of have an odd shell shape. So sometimes you see them falling, hitting something and falling off the rock. So I'm not sure how much they get done in there besides eating scraps, but they look pretty. Yeah. I used to get like pretty good sized ones where I had to like, It almost seemed like when they would arrive to me, I would have to try to give them a bunch of shell options. Like they really Mm -hmm. needed to move like Mm -hmm. quickly whenever they got to my spot. So I'd try to give them shell options. So I'd just sit there and enjoy watching them house hop or house shop, I guess you could say, picking their new shell, Um, which is a cool little thing if you've never seen a hermit crab do that before. I had a large white spotted hermit crab who would – uh, he would always get his shell stuck in this one spot 
and would like kept like a secondary shell right there. So it would like hop out, get into the second shell, go in, grab its shell out of the spot and then switch back into its favorite shell. Dude, he was smart enough to actually help himself. They're they're pretty intelligent. I mean, yeah. they show relatively complex behavior, so that's usually how you're measuring that intelligence. I had one. Um, we gave it a for enrichment. Uh, we gave it an Easter egg with food in it, so it could crack it open, mm-hmm. like kind of like a clam or something like that. And I had one that spent, I think, seven hours trying to get that Easter egg open. Before I gave, like, I took pity on it. And <laughs> just, just you cracked it, it for it. Absolutely. Yeah. You guys just, <laughs> that doesn't really speak to the intelligence, but the dedication to getting that. I just like that was... your other one was so smart. He was like, I know I get stuck here, so I'm just going to put this house over here and I'm just going to hop over and fix what it did. But he still kept choosing to get stuck over there. So he must have yeah, you out know. that, like, either food collected right there or something. And he just, he knew that was a zone. Just like that spot. And we would get, uh, it was, its name was Leonardo <laughs> Pinchy. And uh, we would, we would get the like, calls all the time. I that with some of my stuff. Like, yeah. I, had, names, uh, you know. I had Leonardo Duracio, which was uh, my leopard wrasse. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Only yeah. into those 18 year old wrasses. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Gotta get it. Uh-oh. You okay, Chelsea? Did that mute work? I tried to mute myself. When yeah, I'm yeah. Talking. The you al- did. It was crazy. The, the allergies in North Carolina started early. Huh. Oh my gosh. Don't wait for me. Um, you know what creeps me out though is hermit crabs out of their shells. I don't like enjoy their shape of their back end of their body. Oh yeah, they honest. they look best with pants on. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I can't. They're, mm, they're just weird looking. Uh, although, like, to be fair, that's kind of how you tell when they need to move houses right because they can't go back into their they can't fully go back into their shell also i decided yeah. i'm gonna stop saying right as much because i think that's a little thing that i keep saying inserting so everybody okay. every time i say right let me know in the comments so i can stop it's okay sean gets sean gets on to me because uh i've apparently made a habit out of saying uh you know a few things and he's like hey you said that again i'm like <sighs> yeah we need a word count on us it's only yeah. Fun, well, I got really Absolutely. good for and not didn't uh, use dude a lot. I used to say <laughs> dude for everything, and yeah, that didn't work. But it happens. So, for aesthetically pleasing, what mm-hmm. do you like, Chelsea? If even if they're not a very good cleaner, mm, some of the. I mean, I can't speak to how much they're getting done in there, but some of the double t- tile stars. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. They're pretty. That's a good one. Um, mm-hmm. And found that the, specifically the double tiles are pretty hardy over some of the smaller fromias. Um, so and even over the marbled, actually, I prefer the double tile. So they're nice, good like starters, um, starfish. If you want to get into that. Yeah, I never got. Nice. I never got to keep any of those because I always like harlequin shrimp and. Like, yeah. They love the taste of this. That's an expensive meal. Maybe chocolate chips are a better. <laughs> yeah. Chocolate or just chips like expensive. grow a ton of Asterina stars. Yeah. Culture Asterina. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. So for your favorite worker then, who is your all's favorite worker? I'm going to go with the strawberry conch. Ooh, that's that- a good one. That thing is nonstop and you it's got that little snout that reaches up pretty high, honestly. They get the sand, they get the bottom of your rocks pretty good. They're always on the move and they have very good vision. So I'm imagining they see into all those little crevices. And they know whether or not they're gonna get stuck. That's another thing. They don't feel I don't think that I ever had to really like rescue one of those. That's another it, thing. Annoying they flip pretty them. well. If you've ever yeah. seen yeah, them, conks are good at mm-hmm. not getting stuck. They got a I powerful like. foot. Yeah, they do. Okay, so then, what do you guys like as far as like, aside from our stomy homies, who else do we like that is super efficient? That's an absolute favorite. I like olive snails. Uh, I used to recommend them over Nasarius even 
because the amount of work that they could do because the, the Nasarius are great, but yeah. I don't know. I feel like as a sand sifter, the olive snails just really did a great job and they were bigger. So they turned the sand over more effectively than the smaller Nasarius did. I never had any of those. I always just beat. did a ton Sorry. of Nasarius. Um, what was that Chelsea? They can get the ones that I've got before are big old guys. They're like bulldozers bulldozing around into there. Yeah. Yeah, that they're, they're not. Yeah, they're not small. But if you've got a big tank, right, buying a fleet of Nasarius is kind of expensive. If you invest in a couple of the olive snails, they're going to do similar, mm-hmm. similar work. So, that's true. Right, right animal for the right job. I think that's the biggest yeah. thing with cleanup crews. A lot of people buy the wrong animal for what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah, and that's usually <laughs> when you have like, oh, I just. You know, I bought a ton of animals and then in like a month they're all gone. It's like, well, yeah, you, and, and nothing's changed. You still have your pest problem, whatever that is. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you get the right animal for your tank conditions and for the job it's trying to do, you you get a much more effective uh, cleanup crew, janitorial team. Should we break that, that down longer. Why we're at yeah. it? Like, yeah. So we'll put it. like the snails that like, filamentous algae and then we'll do our slimes and yeah let's do it well and we need to do crabs too so then favorite crab that you like that's an efficient worker who's your favorite hands down i already like this come by uh the scarlet hermits yes yeah yep scarlet and they're pretty. I love just emeralds though too it's hard for me not to like emeralds because i've had really good ones um while yeah. keeping tanks over the years it's very difficult not to like a not to like an emerald i have a love hate enjoy them when they're like really good size like some some people because they'll take out some zoas when they get kind of yeah. big <laughs> yeah some of them they you know they yeah i think the myth the mithrax crabs in general aren't as bulletproof as people think mm-hmm. like they do sometimes switch mm-hmm. off mm-hmm. of algae to other things yeah um usually when they get to be yeah. more sizable I, that's I, a lot of animals though i had a mithrax that i did not put in my tank um a few years back but they are so pretty if you see one and it's older mm-hmm. because i remember the only reason why i saw it was because his appearance was so perfect mm-hmm. sparkling black mm-hmm. i was like what what is this in my tank it looks like a perfectly polished like Cadillac Mm -hmm. and I was like I don't I didn't put anything like this in here and then all of a sudden I saw this claw come out and like take a little piece of algae and I was like oh my gosh what is that and so I had to start doing like all this research and I was like everybody like has anybody seen this kind of crab before and it took a long time to get it identified a lot of people thought at first that it might be um like a different type of gorilla crab I think uh well and that's that's something too like a lot of cleanup crew, when they start small, they start young, eat different things. So a lot of marine invertebrates, when they're younger, are going to have a very different dietary profile than when they're aging. I think a good example of that was um, the red thorny stars. or red. I, I think they were like the red thorny stars. Um, so we used to get them in as. And they, as juveniles, will eat algae. They'll graze algae. But as adults will eat coral (laughs) so it's one of those things where like (laughs) happy birthday um it's kind of like when everybody started getting like the green serpent stars and they're like this thing is cool it's green and then they're like oh until you eat your fish (laughs) yes (laughs) (laughs) i remember that learning curve (laughs) then i all of a sudden i had everybody like bringing me in their green serpent stars and they're like you're like murderer take it back and i was like oh i don't want your murderer (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Like, where killers. am I gonna put him? Mm-hmm. The but they're cool. Be- like they're a really cool animal they if are. you know what you're dealing with and you know. Yeah. I I love serpent stars though. Serpent stars are awesome. Like zebra serpents, the orange serpents, mm-hmm. they're they're just they're so beautiful. Um I think the zebra serpents are my favorite though. I like the oranges, but they can tend to be very sensitive. And mm-hmm. when you see there's just something about a starfish. <laughs> When you see it and it's maybe having uh, an issue and it's breaking down, you're just like, oh, I feel so bad. It's a 
It's a starfish. And I think that's also why some people get hesitant on ever keeping um, harlequin shrimp as well, because they're like, oh, I have to actually feed starfish to this animal. That sounds terrible, but it's part of their diet. Yeah. So. Yeah, we, uh, there was a company years back that I think was hoping to do something with like chopping up crown of thorns sea stars and then selling them frozen for people who needed to feed their harlequins as a way to like deal with an invasive. But I don't think they were able to ever get that's get interesting. I, I'm not sure how that would really work, um, with it being frozen, uh, because you know, they ride along I- on the starfish. Additionally, with that, you know, you're just kind of like, okay, what else do we have to do according to keep this thing alive? But their diet is so narrow, it makes it really tough. Yeah, I mean, they're consuming the tube feet. So you can give them, that's the main dietary thing. And there's not much you can do to replace that. But we uh, we grow tons of Asterina stars not like on purpose, just in our exhibits. Uh, So what we're able to do to feed our Harlequins is to just go through and collect those. And um, I think it's really important that you never deplete your pest source, if that makes sense, when you're getting like these cleanup crews. Another way to make sure you're having longevity of these animals is that you don't fully eradicate the issue. You want to have just enough that they are able to sustain it at a level that you are okay with. Um, because that's what keeps them alive. A lot of people get like Bergias and stuff like that. And then they wipe out all their Aptasia and then their Bergias die. And then their Aptasia comes back inevitably when they put a new rock in or something like that. And so it literally happened to me. <laughs> yeah. It happens to so many people. And that happens a lot with cleanup crews where you're like, I just want this problem gone. Mm-hmm. And you dump <laughs> money into like two to 300 animals and you throw them in your tank and they go like buck wild on your system and then in a month you have no algae and you aren't necessarily supporting these animals the way they need to be supported and then they die and that's why people i think think a lot of these animals don't live very long Um, but if you kind of maintain them they're going to be there in perpetuity so they're going to continue maintaining and supporting your tank so if you do get a little blip where something's out of whack and you're you are getting more of whatever your issue is they're there to support it um but if you completely wipe it out you're not rid of it fully it's always going to come back in some way shape or form you just now have to go out and buy more animals to deal with them so i it's better to like under purchase for the issue and let them work on it a little bit longer term because then they'll kind of Mm self-maintain versus trying to knock it out as quickly as possible Sea hares are like that. But I think that's why it's important. Like one good feature of having our local forums is if you need to buy harlequins, you need to buy a sea hare, um, the bergia. Just, you know, be nice and go on there and be like, hey, this is what I have. I'm they're done doing what they needed to do and move them on, you know, traveling circuits. I do like that. So yeah, yeah. are tough to keep track of too. I mean, that's another thing is they're so little. Oh, gone. You yeah. Know? So that that makes it tough also to monitor those guys. So turkey basters are where it's at. Yeah. With those I think, guys. Oh, that's a good idea. I think sometimes it's like you're not even sure that you even have them anymore. Um, once yeah. a certain point, and then it's like, oh no. But I have had um, I have had instances where I've had customers that have misidentified some of the zoa eating ones yeah. for the bergias. Oh yeah, they had the bergias. Well, they're all aeolids. So. Yeah, and they, you know, they were like, you know, I I don't understand. I'm finding them on my zoas now, and I'm like, uh. Well, you need to, you need to bring me some of those. I need to I need to take a look at that because I'm not really sure if that's still necessarily a bergia that's hanging out if they're strictly yeah. hanging on your zoas. <laughs> we need the to smaller they them. are, the harder it is to tell. Yep, the, the little and babies are similar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So naturally, we gravitate to the most unliked ones. <laughs> so zoa so eating nudies, monty eating nudies. Those guys are fun <laughs> for sure. Red bugs. Yeah. I've never had red bugs. Knock on wood. I have never had to deal with them. Um, but I have heard that they are very difficult to handle. 
but I always kept chromis in my tank. And um, I, I read a long time ago that chromis can, uh, are, they eat uh, or can eat them. Um, I'm not sure if that's been changed or not, but I always kept chromis in with my SPS for that purpose um, because they're always around it and they're always around the SPS. So, but I don't know. That's just from my personal experience. Um, have you guys ever dealt with red bugs? You ever dealt with them before? No, I've been pretty lucky. No. <clears throat> Yeah, I feel very. It's one of those things. It's so important to quarantine, mm -hmm. or at least do like dips and stuff like that, and and check because a lot of times once you get a pest in your system, it's you're never gonna fully eradicate it. Even those like uh, those asol flatworms, the little mm -hmm. brown mm -hmm. flatworms. Like even with something like flatworm exit, you still don't fully knock it back. Yeah, for sure. Well, even um, I think. Uh, well, the Zoe on that topic, festival. what about quarantining our cleanup crew? How do I feel about mm -hmm. that? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So quarantine so, crew. Uh, for the Florida Reef Track project, we quarantine for 30 days mm -hmm. is the recommended quarantine for cleanup crew, just because they're not sure how dis certain disease, coral diseases spread. Uh, so I think that's a good rule of thumb if you have the capacity to quarantine. Um, cause the biggest issue is not that your like snail is going to have a disease your fish could get from the snail. The bigger issue is it's carrying something yeah. that like there's a pest hidden on its shell or in, mm -hmm. cause sometimes they come in and they've got like stuff on them. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. so even 14 days is like, if you could at least do that is not bad. Or I've heard when they, once they do their first molt in quarantine, that, that would be oh, a good yeah. oh, time to then. That would be a good one. Yeah, and I, I, I think I, what I read was around thirty days. Is you should see a molt by then. I guess it depends on the species. Depends. Yeah, it depends on the species of crab or shrimp or whatever. Um, obviously, a snail's not going to molt. Um, yeah, echinoderms aren't going to molt, but. Uh, I think in general, just like having observation time and time for whatever it is to die because there's no food source for it mm -hmm. is ideal. Yeah. But I, I mean, I say that through the lens of a zoo. Um, mm -hmm. So for me personally, when I had saltwater tanks in my house, did I quarantine my cleanup crew? I did not. <laughs> um, could that have led to bad things in the future? Absolutely. You're kind of, you know, it could be totally fine. 99 times and it just takes that 100th time to cause issues so or just now um That's so true if you're buying from a local fish store or online the new thing now is that they'll actually advertise that they're coming from fishless systems so to pay attention mm. to that um which you know if you own Great a point. store maybe you know mark that as an an advertising point that they're not in fish systems make a separate invert system so i mean we all have um macro tanks are kind of big now <laughs> throw throw your snails in the macro tank and hope they don't eat your macro i guess that's a bad idea <laughs> they'd probably go to town but you have a little invert tank that's my point <laughs> yeah well it's nice too because if you have when i worked at the the fish store that i did we had um two rows that were like mainly salt were only saltwater fish and we could treat those rows because the invertebrates were in a completely separate system. Yep. So I think having, we, we also did have kind of more of the delicate reef fish in those systems with the invert. So it wasn't fish mm -hmm. free, but it was definitely having that as its own separate entity gave us a lot more flexibility when it came to the main systems yeah. and keeping those fish a lot healthier. I think a lot of stores already have that, you know, if they're using copper or yeah. whatever they're using, they just have to make a point to advertise it. And then people know, okay, absolutely. I don't have to quarantine yeah. these because they came kind of pre quarantined <laughs> in mm -hmm. a sense. Yeah. Yeah. Or even, you know, if they did do a quarantine, you still, if you have your own observing them because stress, stress happens to fish they can totally change they can be perfect when they're swimming around the store and eating for you and then as soon as you get them home everything all bets are off they don't do anything that they were doing previously and so keep being mindful of that i think is very important um and so if you choose to quarantine at home it's it's still a good precautionary effort i think especially whenever you're wanting regular behavior to come back that you already saw um, the animal displaying when it was in the store um, it's always good practice. So 
you guys, what do you all like as far as odd inverts that maybe not everyone tends to keep, but you had it and you had a very good experience with it? Do they have to be useful or just pretty? They can be both. What are we talking about? Either one. Okay, I got one. Uh, I love Medusa worms. Yeah. Uh, oh my gosh. Yes. They're so cool. Well, and here's the thing: yeah. peanut worms they are great can, too. They can Well, peanut worms, but uh, <laughs> Medusa worms. They they seem totally purposeless, but I've had somebody keep them in a system with a spider sponge, um, and they like graze the, I think the bacteria and like the the schmutz and algae that would just accumulate on the surface of that sponge the medusa worm would graze it and their spider sponge did a lot better because of this medusa worm kind of like grazing the top layer and that's usually where you start to see issues when you have a spider sponge start to like go downhill as they often do um and I just love that you can keep them with an emperor shrimp and it's a commensal pair and they're best friends um because it's cool i cannot and functional remember the last time i've seen one of those just for sale like here no. buy this one no yeah i remember we would we would get them in periodically they were just random it'd be like here you go. we'd order them in oh they had them on the list in, like orange yeah oh, they come in like orange and black and um every once in a while you can get them in uh I know one of our wholesalers, I've sometimes been like, let me know if you get a pair because mm-hmm. I want it. Mm-hmm. That's cool. It's a cool relationship. Mm-hmm. I never kept. But I think. Yeah, too- with the commensal though. Yeah. Dope. It's really neat. It's really cool when, because it's just this little shrimp just riding it like something out of Dune. And uh, <laughs> it's just awesome. It's just a really neat invertebrate relationship. And they, they're so funky. Like, it's a wild, magical creature in Ooh, its own way. Cool. Sorry, I'm like waxing eloquently. And they're, they're not even a worm. They're a sea cucumber. Yeah, I'm imagining like, like never-ending story. They would count. Like they're yeah, a really they're cool. They're the kind of dirt. Invert. Like um, what? I, I love the, um, I mean, I used to call them the grenade of the aquarium industry, which is oh, oh, sea apples. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I love sea apples. I have kept a- cucumbers are getting some love today. Yeah, I, 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 I love all the color variations that they have. I've always been very successful with them. Um, I used to really, um, you know, I used to stress a lot to customers or anybody who wanted to keep them. I'd be like, yes, it can be volatile if it gets upset in your tank. Um, but I've never had a problem. But I also don't have anything that would pester it like i don't have a fish yeah it to pick on just anything um you know i don't have a whole lot of cleanup crew that tends to be crawling all over the place i had more of a minimal number effort um kind of like what we covered earlier um but i i love sea cucumbers they are so dope i've had two die naturally in a system mm-hmm. um that just throughout the years that's interesting whenever they do that no no issues they didn't release toxin like the only you're perfectly right like as long as you don't have things are gonna pester it they're they're great and i think now too with the advent of all this like new bacterial food Mm -hmm. uh i think they would probably do better i think they would crinoids too too. Mm -hmm. like the feather stars Mm -hmm. i'm excited to try some of like the hydrospace and stuff like that with some of these more filter feeding species because i think there's probably more this might help keep them alive and sustain them a lot longer for these notoriously difficult to keep filter feeders i was thinking about the crab for the those starfish the feather stars the crinoid crab squat oh yeah oh yeah those are cool because they do i mean isn't the idea that they kind of ride those guys around and steal their food so which so that would mean that they also need smart small particle food but they're really pretty there's some really pretty ones yeah, they're like yellows and yeah, there's yellow all and kinds black. of colors. What is behavior like for the feather star in the home aquarium? Because I never kept one in a typical home size aquarium. I kept one, um, but it was an, a 1,200-gallon mixed reef that was 20 feet long. So that's Ooh. not something you're going to typically see um, in a that's home. Nice, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was cool. I loved watching it. Um, but 
what does that behavior look like when it gets up and needs to move around and do things like that? Do you guys have experience with that? I don't remember it's them swimming ever. I don't think I ever saw like swimming behavior from them. They would move, but they liked to find a spot to perch. Yeah. And once they found their spot, they were pretty much, that's where they hung out. Um, Underneath they have I these little s- claspers, right? Yeah. And yeah. Like little hold fast. Yep. Yeah. Like little nails. I, I don't know. Little legs. I, little yeah. tiny legs. Little bitty, bitty legs. Harder yeah. and not feathery. And they kind of hold on to a spot with them. Yeah. yeah mine would just like, maybe it's just because he do he had a lot of spots like i just find him somewhere different uh, and i was just like dude I, if you move like this in this big of a system do you would something like this Teleport. do it in a smaller one and then what is that like how do you even manage that because now if you're you know a typical home reef you've probably got an enemies you've got stuff that power heads you've got anything that could potentially hurt it what does the behavior in the home aquarium look like for that animal Well, I think that's, again, back to right animal, right system. So Mm -hmm. if you are going to go with something like a, like a crinoid, like a feather star, is that better placed with horse, like uh, seahorses? I almost said horseshoe crabs. Seahorses (laughs) (laughs) with like Gorgonia. It's very different. Uh, Completely different. Um, One, like what's going to be safe for a seahorse is probably going to be safe for the feather star. They're both filter feeders. You could do gorgonians and things like that, that aren't going to sting as much. Is that a better setup for that animal um, than your mixed reef where there's a really good chance something's going to predate it, which is what happens on the reef in the wild. Mm -hmm. Totally. When they start to go downhill, it seems like they lose their little feathers, just like any starfish loses their legs. Breaking off. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that's pretty sad. Mm-hmm. So I try not to encourage I keeping those. Yeah, I don't think I've had a crinoid live longer than a year and a half or mm-hmm. two years, which seems very much under what it should be. Um, which is why I'm I'm curious with some of these new foods on the market if they're is an opportunity for better success with them. But yeah, they're an expert level animal without question. I even hesitate as like a zoo professional to bring them in just because it's, it's tricky. They're really tricky animals. They're really sensitive. Yeah. But they're really cool. They are really cool. (laughs) They're cool. I don't know. I mean, like going back to sensitivity, like the sea apples, a lot of people believe that they are very sensitive. Mm -hmm. I never, I mean, like I knew while handling it, don't, do certain things or do anything that could stress it out further. Um, but I never, I never really had anything negative happen with a sea apple. And I, I have had them, you know, do the natural dwindling, uh, passing away. Shrinking. And that is very interesting. What, what was your experience like with that, Sarah? Because mine, I feel like is going to be very similar because it was just, it was not fast, but not slow. It just kind of yeah it was over like a year i think we just had it start to like it, it was a big plump sea apple we'd had it for years mm-hmm. um i want to say like six to eight years wow. that we'd had it so a really long time um and uh it just started getting smaller and smaller mm-hmm. Yeah, it and is. that was no matter how much we feed it, it fed it, we would like uh, target feed it constantly, no matter what we did. Uh, just and their little dwindled. their little tentacles, the they change a little bit too. They get a little bit nubbier. Uh, yeah, a little nubbier, <laughs> a little tighter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. I I was wondering if maybe you had kept one that did something similar to that because I I've, I've never experienced anything but that type of situation with it. But I think that a lot of people also uh, may equate that with like, maybe it didn't get enough nutrition, but I mean, you definitely were feeding a lot. I, I was yeah twice a day pouring so. in whatever they could possibly want um, whenever I had them as well. Um, so that's cool. So sea apple. Yeah. All right. So what's that? What's the raw ball y'all have that you've kept? I think I an love, oddball. No, I think they're all awesome. I like the what hot dog it? cucumbers. I like cucumbers in oh, general. Yeah. I, yeah, they're I like powerhouses, them. man. They're awesome. They're great. 
if you've got the right size substrate for them, they are awesome. I, they do need that night that finer substrate for them to do well mm-hmm. if they're a, like a sand sifting or detritivorous like cucumber. But ooh, they are powerhouses. And some of the Florida ones can get like this huge. Long. They're mm-hmm. huge. Yeah, they're huge. Well, and they stretch out too. So I I remember. I used to, I had one of the, I guess the common name for it's like the tiger cucumber. He's mm-hmm. got like all oh, yeah. the spikes on him. The spiky ones. Yeah. I used to have one that he would just stretch like two feet across, just trying to navigate to like a different cave. And people would come in and be like, you have like this like rubber band rope thing in your tank. And I'm like, oh, it's the cucumber. He he's digging around in a hole and the back half of him hasn't decided to catch up yet. <laughs> he's just hanging yeah. out back there and they'd be like, Oh, that's so weird. And I'm like, yeah, he, he you know, kind of splits off. I feel like mine would like make more of itself uh, from mm-hmm. time to time. And I would have people want the babies or I won't want to call them babies, but the split offs from it, I guess, because they'd be like, I know that yours works really good. I'm like, well, I don't know this. This is like a clone. This New Year's this has good genes. It's not lazy. It's not. I was going to say it's a clone, right? So yeah. maybe I want, I want identical. Want it. <laughs> Drop them off. I'm trying to get rid of good old asexual reproduction. <laughs> the yellow ones do that like prolifically. They are yeah. like those little yellow ones. I think yeah. those, those are cool. I've seen a bumblebee shrimp ride those little yellow ones really? into the sunset. Oh, really? <laughs> Oh, yeah. it's super I like funny. The, I like the bumblebee snails, but you need no the, the bumblebee shrimp. shrimp. Oh, the bumblebee. Sh- yeah. Oh, okay. Bumblebee snails are really good. Yeah, they're good for like vermidid snails mm-hmm. and stuff like that because they're going to predate yeah. those. Um, which great for dealing with that pest species. Yeah. Uh, they do an awesome job. I think so you have to remember that, that they. Right. I'm pretty sure how they eat it. They they're not eating the shell. So they still leave the vermited shell behind. So a lot of people are like, "Oh, it's not working." Mm. No, you gotta, you gotta go do some work. Too. Yeah, no, yeah. They do like a 50-50 blend. Yeah, the shell's so gonna like, be I'll, there. I'll kill it. You gotta clean it up. Right, but just look for the stringers. If the stringers aren't coming out anymore, it's like then that it probably who starts the laundry but doesn't fold it at the uh-huh. end. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Yep. All right. I don't do the folding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I cook the dinner, you do the dishes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Same vibe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd like the partnership with your cleanup crew. Mm-hmm. The, the, I've, I've used the bumblebees a couple times. I do find that I need more than usually I put them in like um, amounts of five. Yeah, is what I typically do. Um, and I'll let them go to town kind of like the Bergia where it's just wait, you know, two months and then you look and boom, no more stringies. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so with symbion, sim, bleh, I cannot talk today. For buddy system inverts, we're just going to call this. <laughs> I can't talk today. For buddy system inverts, who do you guys like? Do you like fish pair inverts? I I do. I like shrimp goby pairs. I think they're really I was going to say, practical. shrimp goby pairs are it's awesome. I love them, especially whenever you have like a really good bulldozer mentality type shrimp working with the goby um especially if the goby will cooperate with the shrimp because i've seen some shrimp get really upset with their goby before and like steal them off what the heck chad (laughs) they lock them out of the house yeah they'll like they'll steal it up (laughs) and the goby's like in there trying to to jack around with it and and move the sand and the shrimp's just like opening a new door on the other end like i'm just trying to move away you make it work for it keep this place clean like i want I yeah I love shrimp goby pears I think the biggest thing with any sort of engineering animal so any like sand sifting or moving animal is make sure your rock work is on the bottom Mm -hmm. like don't sit your rock on sand yeah Uh, if you're going to have an animal that does any sort of excavation uh, I like to put like some of that light diffuser the egg crate Mm -hmm. on the bottom so there is like a bit of space between the glass and the rock itself so i don't have to worry about like cushioning it but yeah um because i like engineer gobies will topple rock um our pistol shrimp goby pair they do serious work with the sand um so if our rock work wasn't down on the bottom i could see them knocking some stuff over yeah 
For sure. Just set up your tank appropriately. <laughs> Engineer gobies are notorious for knocking stuff yeah. down. Well, they get kind of, they get on the size, you know, big. Of, of an eel. Um, yeah. And that's they, my eel replacement for people. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. If they don't, oh, yeah. They, if they don't really engineer like Engineer goby instead. Right? Yeah. I used to all the fun of an eel with none of the teeth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There you go. And if you get them when they're babies, they're so cute and you get to see the color transition and that's always fun too. Yeah. But so I love, I also really love sexy shrimp. I think sexy shrimp are one of the coolest ones. I used to have this really neat colony of um, about 20 individuals that lived under a hammer, a branching hammer and they were breeding. And so I could look under the hammer and I could see all the babies swarming all the time and the parents running around. And I was like, man, this is like such a cool little colony situation that I've got going on in this tank. I almost wish I could like isolate it and do like my own tiny tank that's just all these little guys because i think sexy shrimp are one of the the cooler ones um and they're relatively popular i think a lot I of hope people you got footage of that because that sounds really cool no nah, man you know our cell phones were so bad back in 2000 <laughs> <It's a flip laughs> phone. A little nokia replicate it, it's you know it the cell phone that everybody says like why does no one have a good cell phone when they see Bigfoot? It's like that for the early stages yeah. of breathing. <laughs> yeah. Like, what is that? Efforts were made, not very successfully. Yeah. I mean, we didn't have a whole lot of, like, stuff for, like, there was no, like, no orange filters. Uh, you could just yeah. turn your lights on. Just take out the blues, turn on only the whites, and try to get a good picture. Like, that was the gist of early reading. <laughs> photography yeah. for me anyway i don't know if well, sex- so struggled like that <laughs> absolutely sexy shrimp though like they're also really great because they'll they kind of have like the uh the anemone shrimp mm-hmm. but, like so we keep them sometimes with like the maxi mini carpets oh, and yeah. they do really well mm-hmm. um but yeah they won't bother they don't like picket things yeah. i've kept um camel shrimp as a cohort too they're not exactly you get lots of really cool behavior. Really? Um, so there is a lot of, yeah, it's like meerkat man. Or I, never, shrimp. I never kept camels because, you know, they have such a bad rap. Oh, the late coral. Yeah. They they're really bad rap, And it's just kind of like, I'm just not even going to bring that anywhere near my stuff. Cause somehow something will happen. <laughs> but they'll, I mean, they'll, they'll mate, like you'll get like baby little shrimp in the water column. Cause they're larval. Um, but it's it's cool. It's interesting behavioral dynamic. So if you're really interested in an animal with cool behavior, they can be really fun. It's just trying to keep anything else with them. Because yeah. uh, we've we've given them like sacrificial coral or like sacrificial anemones. Um, that like we've got some <laughs> some big bubbles. Like we have a rose bubble that's the long tentacle kind of form. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's like probably two feet across and those things like constantly are splitting. So we're like, okay, well, like we'll give them a rose bubble oh, and they, that's cool. They're okay with it. The rose bubble's not happy about the situation, but the, yeah, probably not, <laughs> yeah. but they, they haven't they They don't treat it quite like they would like a mushroom or like a softy coral that they're more prone to eating. So right. that's how I get rid of my Kenya trees that my clients. Yeah. Throw some camel on shrimp. Me. Yeah, no. just have a yeah have a camel shrimp tank and just throw those Kenyan trees in. We have a like a, some Claudiella, same thing that just go nuts, and we're just like throw it in. Dude, that's actually that's actually pretty cool because then it kind of gives you like a different little tank dynamic. Um, oh yeah, because you could keep them with coralivores, like you could keep them with things that won't go after them. So I'm sure you could do like butterflies with them or. Um, I like for so long coral was like so expensive mm-hmm. that you didn't want to waste it. Yeah. But now I think we're 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 getting so good at keeping coral yeah. that you have people who want to throw away all of these zinnia or these Kenyan trees that go nuts. And it's like, well, you could use these as a as a nutritional supplement for some of your coralivores, your coral your animals that are eating coral in the wild. So Dude, I have a, something to consider. I love I have that. A, I have a tank that's just green star polyp and Kenya trees. And the owner really wanted a puffer. And I was like, you know what? They can sometimes eat those little, we got them a um, Valentini. 
Oh, so like they, they, little oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. They can sometimes eat the coral. I was like, but the, the coral just grows so rapidly in here that actually I don't yeah. care. Like, do you want a coral beauty? Do you want something else in here too to eat your coral? Because we're pulling out so much coral that in that scenario, I think it's fine to have some of these animals that, you know, eat coral in tanks like that. It's fine. It's an exception yeah. to a rule to kind of almost control, you know, your well, it's a pest in that point. Exactly. Your yeah. Yeah. You're making your system self-sustaining. So if you don't have the time or the capacity or just the, the energy to frag all these coral and deal with it, instead of trashing it, get an animal that like you start to treat the coral as the pest mm-hmm. in your own way. So it's just a different type of cleanup crew. I think yeah. that's the theory with some of these. Um, big tanks that people want to keep um, angels in. I think there, there's coral is growing big. I think Jen kind of was talking about this. Their coral is growing so much that they're willing to sacrifice a little bit of yeah. what's in there to keep that animal. So as long as you go into it with that mentality. Yeah. 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 I- if you treat it like a true ecosystem and not something precious like mm-hmm. a photo. Yeah then you start to get really cool behavior because you're letting the animals do what they're supposed to be doing. And that's really neat. And it's just a different way to approach it. I think as opposed to like this bonsai art piece. So it's hard to you... bonsai saltwater. I'm telling you that <laughs> so much easier to, I, I, you know, we, we've talked about this before on our podcast, picking corals for shapes, but man, mm-hmm. the, 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 the skeletal, structure of corals makes it so much harder to control than just freshwater tanks yeah. where you can just go and snip snip yeah but i, I can't well, they I just know. grow differently too yeah it's because anything can affect them it's harder to predict mm-hmm, exactly so you know these freshwater aquascapers got it easy that's all i want to say <laughs> Chelsea calling out the freshwater keepers right, just snip it, snip it and let it float to the top and they scoop it out and I'm over here cutting up my hands and accidentally I'm breaking branches I, air as I go. yes but I don't you know I, I might have to have I'd like spread. 10 Toby puffers and angelfish in, in that one tank to control it so that might be a factor how many of these animals do I need to control or like parrotfish I feel, yeah like if you have some of the smaller parrots like they, the smaller parrots, they, yeah, em, yeah, definitely emphasize smaller. <laughs> smaller parrots. Don't get a giant parrot. Don't get a parrot that is gonna get huge, unless you have a giant. I don't know. There's people out there that have like twenty thousand gallon systems now, so in their homes, I know. they could Crazy. get away with a bigger parrot. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you have these animals that 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 can even help keep their anatomy where it's supposed to be. Like we've talked about puffers getting their teeth grown out or triggers getting their beaks grown out. Like if you've got the things they're supposed to be eating, they should take care of themselves. So the more you can create that ecosystem, the less maintenance it becomes. I agree. Well, and it also kind of like, it adds like a new little element to the hobby itself. What's he eating today? Yeah. Uh, Oh, oh, my Walt Disney. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) Not the Walt Disney. Uh, oh, there goes that bounce mushroom. Oh, oh. Come on, you're like just stomach punching here, Sarah. <laughs> but it, come on, isn't it always like the fifteen dollar animal that eats like the thousand dollars? Yeah, that's why I was rapping on emerald crabs for a minute because they would always go after whenever they would get big enough and they would run out of whatever they wanted to eat that I put them in there for whether they chose to eat it or not, different story. Um, they'd go after my expensive zoas. I was like, excuse me. There's plenty of these that I really would like to get rid of. I never had one do that. I guess, like, I've had it so many times. It's outrageous. But it's like what Sarah's saying. It's probably running have, out of the food personality. source. Oh, yes, yeah. they do. But they also have personality. I feel like some some crabs are just jerks. Oh, yeah. I They'll mean, raise their little jerks. claw at you. Get the ones oh, that yeah. you want to throw play. the claw up. Yeah. 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 I feel like I am so much bigger than you. Mm-hmm. I will win. Yeah. Like, I'll just go down swing. For what that is. Like, as I used to, well, may, maybe I never had a poor experience with my emeralds because I used to, um, I really enjoyed doing a lot of hand feeding and hand interactions mm-hmm. with my tanks. I used to have all my fish do hand feeding to the point where I could 
have them swim up in my hand and and eat and if i needed to remove anybody it wasn't this giant task and with some of my all right little mermaid i know sorry <laughs> um, but with my emerald and Abby's just over here being a disney princess <laughs> oh look at this um but i i did because i i went out of my head to try to get a six line out of a 150 and it was an absolute nightmare and i was like never i spent I'm three days trying to get fun. a damsel out of a tank happy. once i'm making everybody friendly making everybody happy and everybody's got to come to me if they want food so i started doing oh, that so smart fish and so i would take um like some of my, you know, the, the sheets of brine or the sheets of mysis. And, you know, I have like a good chunk of it. And I would just, you just kind of know where some of your inverts tend to hang out. And I would just go and take the chunk and just hand it over and just let them pick off a few pieces and be like, here you go. Okay. Now you're done. I'm going to go feed everybody else. And maybe that, maybe that prevented it. Maybe giving them a little extra treat, um, maybe help yeah, that they- in line. I don't know. But I I thought it worked out well. I never noticed anything. It that's a good. Emerald, though. That's, that's a great premise, though. Like a lot of times in, like they target feed, mm-hmm. um, like in, in big aquariums, like they'll target feed their sharks and mm-hmm. stuff like that. So the animal comes over, specifically for targets, they're able to feed them really controlled and contained. Uh, but you can do that at home. They're like, there's nothing stopping you from, and most of your animals are kind of trained. Like if they're begging for food at certain times. So you can start to to figure out how to use that to your advantage. So if you like always put a stick with a target on it or something that they're attracted to, that can make it a lot easier to catch them yeah. if you have to get them out. Yeah. I used to have my Harlequins. Uh, I used to have them to where they're very good interactive shrimp, by the way, um, for anybody who has not kept one that's curious about it. They mine always it didn't matter which ones i kept or what year anything they will always come out to the front and they'll do their dance and they're like yo i need food send me some drop in that star you know where i'm at i'm doing the dance and i i always loved interactive uh animals like that in the aquarium and um i I just, anything like that, I think helps everybody um, all the way around in the hobby. If, and it also helps bring you into like, oh, this little guy has a personality and I know where he always likes to be. And it's, it is, it's its own little ecosystem, its own little community. And you kind of just get to play a part in it and taking care of it. But I, I love all that stuff so much. Well, what's, what's the quote? It's basically with conservation and preservation, you, you're more apt to conserve and preserve things that you love that you have a relationship that you understand so as we get to understand that all these little creatures have personalities they have particular attitudes and choices of food then that's where we get people wanting to captive breed and um, preserve these animals yeah so i think that's awesome Abby, especially heart, chelsea <laughs> yeah. especially in a a fish store, you know, like when you can say like, yeah. oh, watch this. I've trained this animal to come to me like, man, that captivates kids. You know, that oh, kid's yeah. going to go like next marine biologist. Yeah. yeah. We used to have um, I used to have an epaulette shark, which another awesome interactive animal. Um, if anybody has possibly ever kept one, I had an epaulette shark and um, uh, it was so well behaved that um, when I would have little kids come in for little field trips, and I also would entertain um, some of the retirement centers to bring in some of the elderly that don't get to go out very often, I would also uh, entertain them through the store and bring them in to see the aquariums and interact and see the animals. And I had this epaulette shark that we had trained to, if we just tapped the surface of the water um, three or four times, she would already start to like be moving out and she would come out and she would come up to the surface where we could lift her up from her underbelly and allow kids or anybody to kind of pet her under the water. And it was really cool. I I totally agree with if you, any hands-on interaction um, and anything that shows people like, Hey, look, it's, it's a neat little thing. It, it can be here and you can also come see it and you can learn appreciation for the species. And I love that kind of aspect, any interaction with the animals, is, especially aquatic is so cool. Yeah. That's why the touch tanks, you know, became so popular. Mm-hmm. Direct. Yeah. They build up. They do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. 
love touch tanks. I like Sarah's touch tank at the Butterfly Pavilion. I had so much fun there. <laughs> <laughs> we try to have a nice little diversity. Yeah, I, I think it's really important too, because also how you prep it, right? Like, mm -hmm. okay, we want to make sure like, we're touching in a specific way. We're nice and gentle. That also sets the stage of like, oh, I could hurt this animal. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important too. Of like what I do can have a negative impact. So I have to be careful because this is an animal. Mm -hmm. um, you get that a lot of times with like coral too. Like people are just like, that's not an animal. That's a rock or it's a plant. And you're like, no, it's like a Don't like tell animal. the airport that it's a rock because that then makes that the only time I've ever, not to derail too far, but this is, relevant for those listening. The only time I've ever had issues in an airport where they weren't educated about the coral is me trying to explain to them. And in my head, I thought, oh, if I tell them it's like a rock, it'll be cool. If it's a rock, then it's not cool. If it's an animal, it's more important for them to let you then to think about it longer. If it's a rock, eh, like I said it that way, as soon as I said that, she was like, yeah, you can't take it. And I was like, ah, I should have just stuck with animal. Yeah. So, oh, and then you said it, what, what it is about that. I don't know, but it, as soon as I went from animal to rock, it was then quicker for her to say no. And what you do is you just pull up the TSA website and they have the, and I showed it to the next girl. So I just waited 10 minutes for the girl to get off her shift. I had the liberty to be able to do that, but you don't always. So have the TSA um, website pulled up because some of these people just aren't educated on what these things are. And as soon as you... Yeah say anything in question that they're not going to kill oh water rocks by <laughs> water yeah. animals oh okay let me think a little bit harder about that ma'am chia pets are not animals <laughs> she yeah it was crazy how quickly she turned to like oh no can't have those Isn't it right? emotional support coral mm -hmm. i should have stuck with that exactly and then it was really it gets stressed like i do yep and it was cool because then the second time i went back through one of the girls that was doing the baggage check um was very familiar and she was telling me they had a hawk go through TSA, like one of the hooded like birds that they use for yeah. educational purposes. I was like, that's awesome. So she was like, coral? Oh yeah, go ahead. If you can bring a hawk, go you can bring a coral, so. Wow. That's too funny. Did now they just I did derail. I now have to have like all the story details of this later because like now yeah. I'm just, like, oh, I, I, how do you bring a hawk through an airport? Somebody in the comment section might know. Tell us. <laughs> I assume they did have a cage or holding something of for yeah. the hawk and yeah. it was hooded, but she definitely said that they brought a hawk through. Dude, that's so cool. I, mm -hmm. I've only witnessed, I've never brought through um, myself a piece of coral through TSA after a show. Um, I always just kind of scheduled delivery of whenever I got home with whoever I bought it from. Um, mm -hmm. Because for some reason, I just, I like that a little bit more. Um, but I have been around when other people have taken stuff through TSA. I was around whenever Remy took some stuff um, from Top Shelf through TSA. And it is definitely an, an experience um, whenever you're They'll taking swab it. report. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some Definitely of them know. The time. Yeah. At the airport's coming out of Orlando, Miami. They are not, the whatever. You're fine. Yeah, I know what it I, is. Yeah. And you know what? I think that if my um, memory serves me right, I think that the people that Remy um, was interacting with in the airport there in Orlando, they were like, oh, yeah, we just had um, some people from SeaWorld bring mm -hmm. some stuff through and um, you're totally good to go. Yeah. And I was like, it does really depend on what they do see mm -hmm. regularly come through, whether or not they've had any interaction um, with dealing with that. So definitely be mindful of also what airport you're going through. Yeah. I think Dallas was the one that stopped me surprisingly because that's a pretty big airport. Were, yeah, were you in DFW would... or at you at Love Field? I think that was through DFW. I can see it being time. DFW because they're the international one. Love Field's more of the smaller one. Um, and Love Field's not – not that they're chill, but they are more willing to hear you explain to them what possibly you have that you're bringing through that you may not. DFW has no time for that. Yeah, like, no, we gotta they're, go. Yeah, they're oh, just. That, yeah, she yeah, was. They do not care. Something. Yeah. <laughs> not that they don't care, but they're just like I. Yeah, that bringing up the website. That's a perfect example of something I think that a lot of people could benefit from whenever they get ready to go through uh, TSA security lines. So that's a good tip there, Chelsea. Well, I think it's, I mean, it's, it's a tricky balance, right? Cause you've got to, 
you you have to have regulations mm -hmm. because we've just proven we don't do well with just abject freedom um as a species <laughs> just there's lots of anecdotal history that says we need some rules um i mean that but, brings us to well, the hawaii thing but i'll let you finish here yeah statement. that's exactly yeah. where i was going yes <laughs> but it, it's it's a tricky balance uh because there's a lot of if you don't know what you don't know, sometimes some of the decisions around regulations can seem ill-advised. And there are ill-advised regulations out there, mm -hmm. for sure. There's definitely, um, like, the the Hawaii Fish Moratorium um, was really, in particular, tough because a lot of the research suggested that there wasn't actually an impact to Correct. the fisheries. Mm -hmm. So you do get these external interests um, mm -hmm. that can muddy the water. Yeah, uh, I saw people fishing with yellow tangs when I was there. So just in case you've never well, you can eat them, you just can't sell them to yeah. keep them alive. But I mean, as far we as a, impact, people are using them for bait. Yeah, we had a supplier what? who we would get what? day octopuses from, and he could sell us dead ones for food, but he could no longer without special permits through DNR and why DNR just takes a really long time. Mm -hmm. Isn't that so <laughs> They're going on island time <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. to get any permitting through. Uh, but yeah. So do you want to yeah, what, what talk do you, a little bit of it? Yeah. Well, what do you, what do you, uh, what do you all think about that with uh, the article, um, you know, that we published with those pieces from Indonesia being seen just right there off of, I have lots of thoughts. Boat ramp there. Yeah, I also have some some thoughts. I'll let you go, Sarah. Yeah, I was so, like to hear Sarah's. <laughs> yeah, from the science from, side from of the, it. From the conservation standpoint, um, it, it's in Hawaii in particular, I, I get where they were. I, I can understand the thought process. Sure. Coral is dying. I'm going to put coral out. I would rather put this coral into an environment where it will do well and maybe benefit the reef instead of killing it. Unless I spin that on you and I say they were trying to grow it out to frag it. Oh. Because it doesn't, we don't know. It's cheaper. Yeah. If they're trying to miracle. Here I am assuming good intent. Uh, I'm over yeah, I mean, the bad intent. I mean, I'm assuming the worst. Yang. That's, that's actually a very interesting point. Maybe that was a, Maybe they. Did. I didn't even think about that. Honestly. I did not either, honestly. But especially with all of the Mariculture stuff and all of the Coral Restoration Foundation stuff that I follow, like religiously, I yeah, talked. I didn't, talk, I didn't even that. think about it from that. I'm thinking like, because don't they have? Doesn't the seahorse farm there bring in natural seawater to their facility? So I'm thinking these people may have heard this. They have a reef tank because it said they saw they found plugs. That's the, the corals were on plugs. My, yeah. And I was going for it through an altruistic lens of somebody was like, I'm going to save the coral because yeah, they're nice. benefit of doubt. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, there is a chance it was a, it was a mariculture lens where they're like, I'm going to cheaply grow out coral. And then I have this because I don't, uh, I could be wrong here, but from my understanding of Hawaii, they do not allow the sale of non of coral really on the Island. Like you can't get, coral because of of their protections of their native coral or it's very difficult to get a yeah, hold it's of coral very, in yeah you have to whenever whenever we were there we were speaking with someone um about some of the rules and everything and they they are very very strict and anybody who has traveled to hawaii they give you paperwork before you land you have to fill out a lot of things um basically telling them you're not bringing anything and you're not trying to take anything out. Um, there's a reason for it. <laughs> Hawaii's got yes. Yeah. Messed up. <laughs> yeah, it has. And they're, they're trying to get a grasp on it. And so I think that the regulations are fair. Some of the, the things that are there wouldn't exist somewhere else. And so they want to protect that. And I think that's respectable, but I, yeah, if it, if those pieces also did have plugs, I mean, it could also have been the off chance that maybe someone was like, Hey, I'm, I'm here. And, or, you know, I, I inherited this tank and I don't want these animals to die. Mm -hmm. I'm going to return them, them to, to the, the ocean <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. because I don't know how to take care of this tank. Or, uh, I usually try, like, I usually try to live by don't attribute to malice. What's probably ignorance. So mm -hmm. 
that's kind of the lens I try to view interactions with the wildlife with until I'm given a reason to assume it's somebody doing something maliciously. It's probably based out of ignorance. And even with the mariculture lens, it's most likely ignorance of not realizing that those species aren't native to Hawaii. They can actually do significant damage. There are examples of invasive corals in other ecosystems that are causing problems. The Caribbean has had a lot of issues with, um, the start of invasive coral species. And I think at a top level look, someone's like, well, it's coral, coral's dying, this coral does well, all we need is coral, why is this a bad thing? Mm -hmm. and, or why, um, if we have all this Caribbean coral dying, for instance, why don't we just introduce coral that'll survive there and let it do its thing? And I think what they're missing is the historical context. So mm -hmm. a lot of, uh, government agencies back in the early 1900s, all the way up until like the 60s or 70s, had a pretty willy nilly um, uh, process of introducing biocontrol animals or introducing animals to to supplement without necessarily doing the appropriate due diligence. So uh, in Hawaii, for instance, uh, an invasive land snail, the giant African land snail, Oh, such a cool this snail. Is really cool. Those are really cool. They're, they're <laughs> incredibly invasive yeah, and you're not very, allowed to have them. Yeah, they're very bad. They're like the farmers. To give you context, friends. I huh. can't even have them. Yeah. As a USDA inspected facility with permits, even I am not allowed to have wow. Like we asked. Like we are like nobody can have them. Not even a zoo can have them. Yeah. Um, it's they're really intense. They're really big uh, agricultural risks. So they are, they'll eat pretty much most crops. Uh, there was an issue where some got out in Florida and they were eating the stucco off of the houses because it had calcium in it. Wow. <laughs> they Poor were like Florida. eating stucco. I'll tell you Dude, what, part, I, Florida. <laughs> but uh, so Hawaii, the snail got um, introduced and was causing ag agricultural risk. Mm -hmm. So they, they found this snail called the rosy wolf snail that eats other snails mm -hmm. and they're like oh we'll just introduce this um, like the assassin the snail of right. land mm -hmm. but it did not go after the big invasive giant african land snail of not. instead it went out after the 700 endemic species of tree snails found in hawaii and wiped out most of those i think they're down to like one percent of <clears throat> the original amount mm -hmm. of species mm -hmm. that they had and they have people guarding them things. Yeah, you just you mm -hmm. just don't know. That's that's yeah. the thing that's so tough about nature. Like you don't know who's gonna do what to who and um or what'll out compete. Yeah, they but released, there's no natural uh, predators. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Back in the seventies they released mycid shrimp into um waterways. Uh, Colorado has mycid shrimp that were released uh into reservoirs to be food for larva, like larval game fish. So they're like, oh, here's a food source. The the baby fish will eat this. The problem was that the baby fish were too small to eat the mice and the mice actually outcompeted them for food. So you had, and that's happening up in like British Columbia too. That's where um, PE mice is. Like mm -hmm. PE mice is invasive mice mm -hmm. that are outcompeting game fish. So you don't always know the impact of all of the life stages of an animal, especially when invertebrates are so poorly understood so mm -hmm. introducing a coral into an ecosystem in in theory you're like oh well i'm just helping a coral reef but you don't know the impact of the entirety of that life cycle will it outcompete other endemic species that are slower growing and you don't have a predator because it's not it hasn't evolved in that ecosystem so there's a chance something might eat it but there's a really good chance nothing will eat it Mm -hmm. And it has widespread devastation and knocks out species. If you want to introduce invasives just so you have animals, like the world would be overrun with rats and starlings. Like it, biodiversity is what keeps ecosystems working. Mm -hmm. It's what keeps them healthy. It's what keeps them functional. Right. So biodiversity is critical to have these all of these ecosystems work effectively and be resilient. And I think that's an issue too. If you have these monocultures, there's no resiliency. And that's when you can get a disease that wipes everybody out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and proper predation or proper predators, yeah. that's a big deal. That's why, um, you know, there's so many different things that revolve around sharks and the reefs and how mm -hmm. they actually keep the reefs healthy because they are yeah. a critical part of the chain length of, of life that go on in the reefs, um, even though they can be scary and a little bitey. 
at times. You need those top level predators yeah. just as much as you need the foundational animals. You need the top level predators as well. Yeah. And I think the fact is we just don't know enough at this point of what animals are linked to each other because even the Bergias, for instance, I don't remember the Bergias when I first came into this being a thing that we could just get readily. Yeah. Like, I didn't know. Oh, the, okay. So there's Aptasia. So there's Bergia that eat Aptasia. There's Harlequin shrimp that, eat, you know, like there's all these connections that we're not quite sure on all of them. We're finding out a lot more, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. But take one thing out of its environment, you're either, you know, then you're, then you're, then the thing that it, that it, where it came from that it needs, I'm explaining this very horribly. <laughs> okay. So if we take starfish out, okay. The Harlequin's connected to that. So it's a, it's a chain of series of events that we're yeah. contributing to, not just on one side of the world, but probably two at the same time as we Peripherate, peripherate, peripherate. Peripherate. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Well, you don't, you don't, yeah, too, you don't, you don't know. So like uh, a great historic example is um, you had fur, like fur tradesmen knock back otter, sea otters mm-hmm. off the coast of California and sea otters predated uh, the purple sea urchins and kept them in check. And what happened was when you knocked out the sea otters, the purple urchin populations exploded and mm-hmm. then they started chewing up all the kelp hold fast and all the kelp started getting knocked up to the surface yep. of the ocean. So you lost all these huge kelp forests and you lost mm-hmm. all of the, the animals that needed that environment. Yep. So it's, including that's sharks. a really clear. Including yeah, because they have their eggs, their mermaid purses yeah. in the kelp yeah. forests. So I mean, it's sometimes basic. it's a ri- mm-hmm. good. Oh, I was just gonna say like, you, you just like, who would have thought, oh, if I kill all these otters, all the kelp's gonna go away. Right. Because there's, they're not linked together you would mm-hmm. never expect that relationship but because it there was that little in-betweener you know mm-hmm. it it just it's so easy to knock an ecosystem out of balance if you don't know what you're doing and so often we're looking at a book where most of the pages are blank mm-hmm. so it's just really tough to to yeah. make decisions and that's why sometimes it seems a lot of these government agencies are moving really slowly and maybe sometimes they do move too slowly, but it's because they have a history of really jacking stuff up. Yeah. They are much more cautious now yeah. of the impacts of their choices and how lasting those ramifications can be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that's background context we sometimes forget about or miss when we, as hobbyists, want to want to help um, in, in these bigger issues. So it's, it's a really tricky fine line of what's too much help, what's not enough help. And this is a really great example. If it is an altruistic person who was trying to repopulate the reef, you can make a lot of bad things happen, even with good intention. Yeah, 100%. I agree. And just, but that's why education is so important, because it doesn't take oh, yeah. that much research or that much Googling to find out the basics of what we just said. Um, which, so I think it's nice that the Hawaiian government DNR, if you have something in question, turn it in without penalty is what the article said. Mm -hmm. So that's great because everyone's kind of scared of, you know, they want to do the right thing, but (laughs) scared of the consequences in this scenario, anything in question. I think they even said, if you see anything where you're out there, let us know. Mm -hmm. Um, But school education too. I mean, I, I was, lucky that I grew up in an area. I grew up on the Eastern shore of Maryland. So we have our brackish water. They're very big into, I knew that like that basic, you know, don't introduce anything into the wild. That's not from that area as a kid, because that's what they literally taught us that in school. Mm -hmm. And so I think even for schools that aren't directly connected to a waterway or body of ocean, ocean near them to educate that. Cause that should just be basic. And it just takes one. Like, I know people don't think that that is true, but so often it can be true. Like, if you have a, a, and you see it a lot in insects, like the spotted lantern flies or like um, zebra, quagga mussels. I think insects is the one that everybody definitely understands. Don't 
that thing messed up because yeah i've never seen so many people come together to like kill something like spotted lanternflies my mom was like running around with like an alcohol spray bottle she's like i got it yeah yeah i think insects uh, for the most part i think people really do understand the impact that they can have we just have to understand applying it elsewhere and to other animals yeah Mm -hmm. like um we oh god when i worked at the the fish store we would have the local like park rangers or like local like fish and wildlife sometimes they'd come in with a photo of an animal and they're like hey we have this weird animal that's popped up at a local lake and we're like that's those are that's jaguar cichlids yeah well uh, says yeah i mean a lot of times it's like carp or goldfish or stuff but like jaguar cichlids somebody just let loose a pair of jaguar cichlids into this pond and they were decimating the local fish because they were so aggressive comparatively what to those other fish are used to and it was just like you have as as an animal as somebody who keeps animals you have a responsibility that once that animal is in your care it is your job to deal with that animal until you pass it off to somebody else Mm -hmm. like you don't get to just throw it out into a pond because you don't want to deal with it anymore 100 percent. like that like things like that are what get stronger stricter regulations if you want more lax regulations if you want to have more flexibility more freedom like as a hobby we have to hold each other accountable and not do that stuff because that is what gets blanket bans on things Mm -hmm. and i think where it's such a precipice right now regulate like regulatorily speaking where there's so much pressure on, and so much of a lens on our industry that mm-hmm. we we have to be better. We have to do better if we want to make sure that we're not going to be punished for kind of the the yahoos <laughs> who are just doing stuff. And yeah. hold hold your your local community accountable. Mm-hmm. Like if you hear about somebody in your local reef club or your local like fish group and they're doing things they shouldn't be doing, hold them accountable. Like peer pressure them if you need to, but make or give them better options. Yeah. I just yeah. I don't want us to lose this amazing thing because a small group of people are making really poor choices. And this right. is gonna have lasting impacts in Hawaii. I can guarantee like a breach like this, it's gonna impact policy moving forward. Yeah. How is up Yeah, you guys want your yellow things for, you better, you yeah. know. Yeah, we're, we're so close to getting that Hawaii fish ban lifted. They're like, oh, no, you can't have coral. Yeah, well, no, now you get nothing. <laughs> yeah. Aww. Well, let's... It just takes a small few to ruin it for the rest of us. I mean, we kind of talked about that just in general. We were talking about that at Reefstock, about the use of medications and antibiotics, about how the government right. is becoming more aware that, you know, we have things that aren't regulated or it's so, like, yeah. nondescript that you could be used wrong and cause harm. And so yeah. the more we continue on that path, like you said, the more restrictions they're going to place and take away. And Well, and that's why education well, is so critical. And yeah. as we seek to gain more knowledge and as we try to uplift the people who are trying to make the impact and gains of knowledge and education, we need to help and get that out there because that's going to be what can really save a lot of, species save the hobby save the Mm -hmm. all of that uh save the love and the passion that goes along with this hobby um in this industry is it's all gonna really come down to education i think um for the most part because unless we start telling everybody and trying to find more answers and seek more guidance through people who are doing lots of research and dedicating their lives to it um we could fall into those areas where there's a hard stop like no you're not going to get anything anymore from hawaii and that will be sad i think that falls into what sarah was talking i i I honestly had a more of appreciation after doing the behind the scenes with you sarah um, because sometimes we can see zoos and aquariums as like bad guys it's like oh they're putting them in these little glass boxes and but just the the effort and the love that you guys put in behind the scenes to take care of these animals, rotating them out of exhibits, um, their food, their enrichment really gave me a, a whole new appreciation for visiting yeah. these places instead of feeling 
like, oh man, it's stuck in this aquarium. I feel like they're contributing to education, but they are getting the best care. And I was listening to one of the keepers at um, a Dallas World Aquarium. Is that it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Same thing there. Same thing there. Just the enrichment and the care that these animals get. Um, I think there's sawfish is, was one of the ones that one of the keepers was talking about. Paula, I think is her name. Yeah, um, Paula. But, He's but so wow, good. just... Just to hear that. We should have Paula on the show. I think Paula. We should. Oh, Paula's great. Let's let's do it. I'm going to mess with Paula. I know. That leads us into that, you know? Like, who do you guys want to see? Some of these people that are hidden away in some of our aquarium. Hidden gems. Yes. Yes, I think there are a lot of hidden gems um, in our industry. And it may just be because maybe they don't... um, Maybe they don't know where to reach out to, uh, or they're maybe busy, you know? know some of us. Um, they're busy saving like, the world. Doing busy stuff. saving the world. Yeah. yeah. If you, if any of our listeners or any of our viewers know anyone that just loves the education and you know works with some of these animals or have dedicated themselves to it, definitely reach out um, to us at Reef Builders. We love that we definitely nurture it we very much support it um and we will we will always welcome it um for conversation because i really do believe that that is going to be critical for all of us for for everything and and as we discover them through the podcast those can also become you know speaker lineup for shows because that's where Mm -hmm. a lot of hobbyists get their introduction Mm -hmm. to the more scientific side of this hobby um so we can start to get a list um for for some of the shows that we're involved in and get some fresh speakers i know just in north carolina there's even just aquatic vets here that i'll have to look Mm -hmm. up their names because i would love to get them on to talk about specific you know we like to kind of go Oh, where yeah. our hearts take take us sometimes, yeah. but you know there are people that have niche specific yeah. degrees and and would love to talk to them. Yeah, let's do it. Absolutely, let's do it when it, whenever. I mean, you know, I think that the more recognition that we give to these people as well, the the better off everyone will be. Because I mean, if if you've dedicated your life and you or you've dedicated many years to something, I think that you should definitely be rewarded with getting your voice heard somewhere, anywhere. And um, I we're I really tired of listening to ourselves talk. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like, come on, guys. <laughs> or if there's particular I'll topics, I, yeah, that people are interested to, yeah. I think. Uh, Help us we're out. always, ex- yeah, we're always excited to talk about something new. Yeah. And uh, there's, there's a good diversity of experiences in this yeah. group. And so if people are interested in specific topics for us to deep dive into or find experts in to bring onto the show, yeah. I, I love that. I'd rather talk about stuff people actually want to listen to. <laughs> yeah, right. Than go, yeah. And wax eloquently about Medusa worms. I don't know. <laughs> hey, man, I, I think, you cool. know. <laughs> I bet I you we have some... an article or something about those soon because now everyone's <laughs> going to be like, oh, dude, yeah, those are kind of cool. Um, but speaking of pad. stuff, you know, another thing that we've got, um, well, currently right now, this video, of course, will be published later, is right now we're doing our um, Reef Royale, which is the Zoanthid contest. And Sarah, we know that uh, maybe you and so many kids don't uh, get along very good, but that doesn't mean that you don't appreciate them and you don't think they're beautiful. Um, so our sweet 16 oh, um, that everybody's voting on. I I like this list. Um, I, I have kept um, the majority of these and have enjoyed them, but um, that- Hit us with some. Do you have do- the list there? I do. Okay, so the Sweet 16 right now is we've got the Grandmaster Crack. We've got Acid Reflux. I'm not real sure off the top of my head what that one looks like. I um, really like those. The Butt Muncher. I had those. Um, salted Agave. I do think those are very beautiful. I like anything with the speckles. I think that because it can have a variation of pattern that whenever you have a large cluster of zoanthus, it just makes them beautiful. Are you still laughing you- about Butt Muncher, Sarah? <laughs> Totally so laughing. I just in my head was like, you know which one didn't make this list though and I almost said something about it from the get go to Remy was uh, y'all have to excuse me I'm going to possibly curse here but the blonde blue eye 
bitches, mm -hmm. the BEBs, those were so popular for a long time uh, when they first came out because everybody just wanted to, I think, go into a store and ask if they had it. <laughs> or or I as, as crack. Yeah, as crack. I want to do a thing at a show where you just go up to random people and you go, is this a real Zoanthid name or not? And oh. you just have a list of real Zoanthid names and just absolutely fake names because i couldn't tell you you could just, just mix in like some a, real ones with it and they could be like oh yeah hey, I, have, I have that hey hey like oh Remy, yeah do you like you the cannot purple steal squirrel this. fart what <laughs> the what the purple squirrel fart zoanthid right have you ever heard of that well, okay there was you're right farts. after a second i was very yeah, farts for a very long time very farts very farts. Were very farts purple very squirrel farts no i had a friend well a, a guy i worked with at the fish store who i think that was when like the zoanthid names were really starting to to take off Get and wild. kind of getting yeah we really wild and, weird and creative yeah uh and he was like if i ever named a zoanthid i would name it a purple squirrel fart because it would blend right into the pack but that so that to this day, that's always what I think about when I think of just like the craziest Samantha name I could think of was Purple Squirrel Farts. Let's um, one day awesome. let Remy and Chris Meckley go around and like talk about the coolest, prettiest, yada yada, and we go around at the next show doing that where we're just and like we'll Zoanthid we'll, or not. We'll, we'll so find the oh, yes. third name. <laughs> that's what we need to find. We need to find the abs most absurd fashion name for a coral at the show. That's what we need to find. Oh yeah. That we gotta be. have our thing, yeah. You know, <laughs> okay. So after salted agave, we have the utter chaos. I I love these. They have they've been my favorites um, for many years. Um, Rainbow incinerator hallucination. Oh, those always them. melted for me. The hallucinations. No, the rainbow incinerator. Oh, I, I agree, there. Chelsea. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I never I never had that one. That one came along later. I think um, the stratosphere exosphere. We have melters, melters. Well, uh, Exophir. Space uh, monster. I did like the space yeah. monster. I thought the space monsters mm -hmm. were cool. Um, pink zipper. Pink zipper. I'm surprised pink zipper has gotten as far as it has. I think it's because it's a good grower. too. Um, because I'm I'm very surprised. Um, mm -hmm. Adonis, the white zombie, Mary Jane, like and Oscar the Grouch. I do like Mary Jane's. I um, do as well. I, I think that they're one of the understated corals that look better with the daylights on though which mm -hmm. isn't a That's lot true. of zoanthids i think um but i used to try to even it out where it's like this one looks good with daylight and this one's more nighttime and we'll put them side by side and they'll even i wonder if some of those melters need more white light i feel I don't like no man because when i throw off scar and... faces i tried and the scar face used to just do me dirty all the time <laughs> Cause, well, I just feel like with, when it comes to zoanthids, like so many people keep them under blues because mm -hmm. that's when you get the coolest coloration. I, I'm just wondering if some of the melting of certain color more because they're they're all captive reared at this point. Mm -hmm. So in theory, you're not dealing with a lot of like the extraneous like that they should be designed for captive settings. Sure. So yeah. if you consistently are having ones that are melting, there has to be some sort of deficit mm -hmm. in your system that they didn't have in the main. Mine was always were... nitrates. Mm. when the nitrates got oh low. so they're just particularly sensitive mm -hmm. yeah or I mean, like um it could be just all of them it could be a variety of all of those different components and just different mannerisms levels that make it yeah, yeah. none of those my were micros is, right like that we just talked. i didn't turn on my overhead lights <laughs> huh? sorry it's getting dark in here everybody <laughs> I'm alexa turn on the light well i i texted people oh. to turn on lights and um they're all passed out so they oh. to me. You told them to be quiet. They listened. I know. Then they all went to bed. And I can't have Buster do it because he's too short and fat and he can't reach the light switch. Buster's a plug. <laughs> he is a plug. Buster's a plug, just so everyone knows he can't get anywhere near the light switch. So he's definitely no help. It's a it's a it's a joke. <laughs> Did we have any microzoas on that list? Uh there were um well this, I feel like the Ross does. Awesome Blossoms? Were they feel, on there? Uh, I think Awesome They're Blossoms. They're not really. Um, then, uh, let's see here. Uh, well, I feel like um, the Hornets used to be more of a micro as well, but I think that 
they've kind of like evolved, I believe, in the industry where they're there's not a couple different to frag anymore. Yeah. Um, but I do remember when I first started getting Rosses and they were just something else to frag. They were they were so little. Um, and I, I think that um, what else was there that was I feel like some of these were, were good sized polyps. I don't remember too many little micro ones, though. Um, but there were some on there. I just can't think of the names off the top of my head. But I think the awesome blossoms I really like. You like awesome blossoms? Yeah, they are smaller. I don't know. They're not the smallest. What what kind of coloring do they have? Purple and, uh, or not purple, pink and green. Like a pink center. Oh, okay. Green. They're really pretty. Blossom makes sense. Hmm. If you really, if you like that color um, scheme, the um, worldwide coral pixie dust are a little bit harder to find, but also awesome. My eh, closer to micros, but they're kind of more purple than pink. Hmm. I okay. really, I like those a lot. Dude, I like all of them. I like all the sizes. It's just those frag- aren't on the list, by frag- the way. I just fragging is there. where I draw the line of whether or not I truly like to mess with that zoanthid or not. <laughs> so, you gotta but, be careful. Yeah, yeah. Well, and just like detail it's so easy uh when fragging the micros to have a massive um problem <laughs> when stuff I've, is in the end <laughs> yeah you've kind of eliminated a good portion of your colony <laughs> so. i wait on those till they're pretty grown out so yeah they can do i did too chunks. where they have like a yeah where they have like a like a i don't want to say like a, a natural vein yeah like an edge where you could kind of pull it up versus cut it yeah and, i'm talking like five plus polyps you can't do any of this three some of those bigger ones are fine three polyps you can't it, yeah you got to do five plus on those micros yeah if well, even I, like maybe 10 oh, plus yeah. yeah well and especially when they're the more matted type i feel like mm-hmm. those are the toughest for me 100%. to frag mm-hmm. um Maybe not for some others, but I think I just have like a natural shakiness to my hand. And so anytime I'm just like, oh, I really need to be absolute precise here. My hand's just like, yo, what's up? And I'm like, okay, well, we're not fragging today. It's just not a fragging day. My hand You're is- not doing my surgeries. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I'm not. Doing it. You need some potassium. <laughs> is that what it is? It's your bananas. I do. I have like almost. Hey, cut day. the Red Bull, lady. Right. Oh, I think that's the, it's cramps. Potassium's for cramps. Oh yeah. <laughs> yes, you know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I would like cramping muscles. Mm-hmm. Not yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Because I was just like, how's that gonna help? No. My like if you get like a Charlie horse, you could like yeah, yeah. <sighs> well, that's she not might be getting a Charlie frag- horse while she's fragging. Dang it! <laughs> Meat tenderizer. Have right, you now we're just getting crazy. Like scrubbing and yeah, <laughs> Meat tenderizer everything. Everything at all. Meat tenderize it. <laughs> migraine meat tenderizer. <laughs> Have you tried treating your migraine with meat tenderizer? Yeah, did really good at getting the nemas- those nematocysts out. <laughs> those brain cells. Now we're just off the rails. As we devolve. Oh. Just well, so anyway. Chelsea had a bit of a migraine. We're, well, we're an hour and a half now. It's when it gets weird. <laughs> had a bit of a migraine yesterday, and she was telling us uh, about it and asking if we all had any insight. And she was like, I might just throw meat tenderizer on it. So that's where that came from. So now the inside joke from inside the chat can be outside the, ch- the chat. Well, that's, yeah, that's so specifically everybody can join in just here. Me. Uh, but yeah i didn't realize how like that that was kind of weird like i had assumed you would both know about meat tenderizer like i didn't realize that was a little bit more on the obscure side i think we knew about it but we were more just like does she have that around and then we figured out that you do in fact add that to emergency kits at butterfly pavilion so yeah absolutely yeah so now we're on board you don't need a lot of it yeah it goes it goes it goes far it's just a death but it just, it will continue good. to be just a dusting, mm-hmm. just a, a dusting, pinch. Pinch. little drizzle, little salt bay. Oh, okay, that's good. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, I'm kind of sad good. that, like, because that's probably where it stung. So you know, <laughs> kind of even if it's on the same arm, you could just line it yeah, up and just kind of, yeah. Okay, well, there you go. One-handed. Yeah, and still be working with the other one. There you go. I'm More sad that Remy's gonna cut out my background because have you guys seen my yellow sesser? I know. Right oh, is it out? Yeah, he's right here. You see him? Yeah. 
He's been, he's been out the whole I time. I love assessors. He's They're been not good. okay. I feel like everybody thinks the cavefish are super shy. They are only shy if you've got big yep. jerk fish. Mm-hmm. If you have plenty of caves, I know it's counterintuitive, but like the more, and this works for freshwater too, like the more cover the animal has, the more likely it is to come out Mm -hmm. because it can get away quickly. Yeah. Yeah, It can get away quick. Oh, there's the pink streak too. Same thing. Same concept. Yeah. Although I'm looking at Or if you have like dither fish. Yes. That's the term I was looking for dithers yeah Yeah. so dither fish fish are like uh like those dumber schooling fish so Mm -hmm. if you have like intelligent fish yeah chromus or dithers uh tetras and danios tend to be dithers in uh freshwater systems but if you have like smarter smaller fish they will look for those schooling fish and if the schooling fish are out they're like okay it's safe Mm -hmm. and if the schooling fish aren't out no there's probably a predator around Mm -hmm. so those are fun like inner dynamics of your tank too where you can use behavior of certain fish to better bring out the behaviors you want in your shyer fish Mm -hmm. that's a good one i like that i feel like i did that without thinking i was doing it when i would always try to do um jawfish with oh yeah my gobies and my antheas and the chromis and all the the, the shyer wrasses um when i would have some of my more um shy wrasses that didn't really come out a whole lot um like my mystery wrasse i used to have a really really shy one and it he or she would only really come out if like the entire school of my antheus was happy and near the front of the glass that's the only time when she would be like all right everything's cool I'm coming. we're good it's safe this yeah. is the perfect example of personalities because my mystery ras was like a velociraptor and he would chase my barnacle bunnies and try to eat them but he would there was yeah that yes, can happen they, you see what I'm saying? shy is not the word that would be would describe him he was the worst actually really um, and it was terrible because he was gorgeous i i have oh. issues that don't fit into the personality that you think they're going to or they say they should fall into category there's all there's always like that odd that odd bad guy but i think that that's important too so when you go to a fish store and they're giving you recommendations like i used to always give like the scope the entire scope of everything i'd heard of that animal Mm -hmm. where i'm like in yes this is reef safe technically but (laughs) I have heard stories like my dad had a pair of Ocellaris clownfish that pushed an Antheus into an anemone and killed it. (laughs) This is anemone was terrible. And they were just like, I mean, I think we've, we've now as a hobby come to terms with that, you know, Nemo's kind of a jerk, but there are (laughs) personalities to your animals that. So we we show murder though. Yeah. That was premeditated, you know, but, uh, we didn't have like a detective fish. We just had surgeon fish. So, um, <laughs> boom, boom. I know it's such a dad joke. I hope <laughs> that made Remy happy in the background, but, uh, you can have animals that are particularly like spicy mm-hmm. when it's not normally an aggressive species. Mm-hmm. So that's something to consider too, that a recommendation will be given to you, but your animals are individuals and they will act as yeah. individuals yeah. to your benefit or to your detriment. The spicy um, ones will live longer though. It's always those that live the longest. They fight, Steve. That's true. Mm-hmm. They'll fight you. They'll fight death. They'll fight anything. They're fighters. <laughs> I think one that I always stayed away from for that was I never had a coral beauty um, in my own tanks. Like, yeah. I I love them for everyone else. But for some reason, every time I ever tried a coral beauty, it was just like, it is time. We're going to wreck <laughs> everything. I mean, yeah. we had one that would pluck the plugs and just just grab the corner of the frag plug and throw it off the rack. Just boom. And I was like, why? I don't like it there. This is not even bothering you. So then I was That's like- It's not hey. feng shui. Yeah. I was like, okay, I'm just going to move the rack to the other side of the tank. Maybe you're going to be fine there. No, no. Just rip it right off. I was like, this fish has to go. And then- um, I just never wanted to keep a coral beauty after. I chose the cherub angel instead, which I love cherub angels. They're cool. Mm-hmm. They do. They are very mm-hmm. tiny. Still. Uh-oh. See, see, Chelsea's got a bad one. Yeah, Chelsea. Chelsea has a bad experience for the cherub. Mm-hmm. So. Well, it was my own dumb doing, but he's he, they're not very seahorse compatible. Let's just put it that way. 
Oh yeah, they can oh, be no. food hogs. They're food hogs and also and I shouldn't have I mean it was captive bred, so I was like, well and it was on listed on a seahorse website page mm-hmm. as something compatible. So I was like, oh yeah, well, okay. But it um also killed the blenny. I had a tail spot blenny in there. Oh, I love I watched it blennies. kill the blenny. Oh. Yeah, it it was pretty bad. So he had got, you know, he got to go in the sump for a little time out kind of they found a new home yeah exactly and he'd be yeah. mad down there and he'd be like splashing around it's a big sump like he's he's fine for 24 hours until he gets into a new home he was splashing yeah. overnight like a shark just thrashing around in there like how dare you just like a cherub <laughs> yes a cherub he was just like how dare you put me in here so it's like it's got like little dog energy <laughs> just... it was a bulldog that fish i'll tell you what See, oh, there's one so for funny. every good one. There's there a bad is. one. Yeah. Well, like I, I love bicolor Besides. bunnies, but I've had people that have had bad experiences with yeah. bicolors. Royal I grandmas. Think. Oh, I'm. Yeah. I'm not a royal grandma fan. Once I went black cap, I could never go back because <laughs> it just that fish is just so cool and mm-hmm. it's vibrant. It does not matter how old that fish gets; it stays vibrant purple from year one to year 13 i can tell you from experience absolutely it stays purple when baslets i yeah. love i love baslets Just yeah group. baslets are super cool yeah yeah now i will say though that the royal grandma if you've ever looked at them like really close at the the color when it transitions transition. from purple to yellow that's actually a really cool pattern i mm-hmm. would love to see that under a microscope, what that looks like. I think that would be really intriguing. Well, you should get Michael Vargas on that then. You know what? Um, I need to have a conversation with that gentleman because I want to pick his brain on things. Yes. Fish scale pictures. Or reef builders. Yes. Or is fish scale like yoga pants? <laughs> Well, what what is well, that core morph- morphologic that's doing the like? Oh yeah, yeah. I have yeah. I have I have fish scale leggings that are hot like a black holographic they're kind of maybe maybe i I have a yellow fish dress too i have a lot of cool stuff i have i because i I, when i was earlier in the hobby i of course i was like there's nothing out here for chicks and so i started trying to find everything that i could and uh then i went crazy and bought it all and i love reef related t-shirts and stuff (laughs) I know. Mm-hmm. We need to all do a brainstorm and do some merch. So Get on that. also anybody with su- suggestions for merch um, that's, you know, kind of cool. You don't really see that you'd love to see. Let us know because we're all going to be getting together and figuring out that fun stuff. Uh, Remy is helping me with uh, our store, which I'm sure he probably wished that I would forget about that he gets to do, but I'm not going to let him. And uh, we get to do all that fun stuff here coming up i have so so many ideas to keep remy entertained (laughs) merch (laughs) let's do it just send him a giant list everybody send me a list so we can just present remy with this giant hey we want this merch list and uh then i can yeah do all that fun organizing with him so we got some homework for the listeners and that is merch special guests yeah topics that's some homework. Yeah. Help us out. Homework. Yeah, definitely. So if you haven't fallen asleep, cause I've heard that listening to the three slash four of us can get very lulling. Cause we're so, yeah. Our voices are so bedtime story that um, <laughs> if you haven't fallen asleep. <laughs> we just need to randomly start screaming in the middle. It'll be fine. Well, yeah. Jason, <laughs> Jason, the cookie fish cookie guy, also known as fish cookie guy. Yeah. Um, was saying that. He's like, yeah. And I'm just, uh, uh, it's like I fall asleep. And I was like, well, I'm going to throw in some like claps every once in a while. Some hard so rock. It's for you, Jason. I have, I have one of those really Dream cool milk. air horns. <laughs> oh, Lord. Well, who has ever alarm went off earlier? That I was, did you see my eyes? I was like, who's that? Was, that me was up. me. That was my alarm for uh, figuring out what's for dinner. And I forgot mm. to turn it off after I kicked everyone out of the house. <laughs> so. Just leave it on there every time we podcast. <laughs> yeah, just be like, oh, there went Evie's alarm for dinner. Uh, yeah. But 
Well, ladies, I, I enjoyed this. I thought this was fun, more chill. Unfortunately, we couldn't have Jen, but that's okay. Um, we will have Jen on probably next time. But yeah, let's start getting some guests in here and we'll do some rotation and we'll have a lot of fun with that and bring in a lot of new uh, new voices and new ideas, new thoughts, all that fun stuff. So, all right, girls. Well, I'll catch you all in the chat. Me and Chelsea will do the usual and make it to where Sarah and Jen have 100 to read before they get to the actual <laughs> course of what they're supposed to be reading. <laughs> and until, absolutely right and until then uh we will see you all next time on the next ladies reef therapy and y'all have a good day bye guys bye bye <laughs>